Hi guys. Hope you had a good weekend. I uh, hope you were able to get out and enjoy the warm weather. I know it's a little windy, but it's still nice. I know for myself and my family to get outside and do some things, kind of get through this time, makes it a little easier. Uh, but guys, we've been looking at industrialization and now we're ready to move forward and kind of uh, come back to kind of more kind of political uh, country, nation type situations. Um, and so we're going to look at a series of revolutions and uh, the spread of nationalism, which we've talked about nationalism before, but we're going to get a, a heavy dose of it now. Uh, so guys, during the 1820s into the um, 1840s, 50s, all the way into the 1870s, uh, you really had this clash of ideas, class of clash of idealism, uh, and so you have on one end conservatives. Okay, uh, these are people that want to maintain our old traditions, how things were before the French Revolution. Okay, monarchies, um, kind of the Catholic Church, religious uh, things like that. Uh, and then they also you also have the liberals and they want to elect their rulers they support the rights of the people they are people of the enlightenment mostly um, and so you have liberals as well and then you have nationalists and these are people who show intense pride in their nation or nationality so uh, a nation, guys, can be a group of people that uh, have something in common, some common history and um, usually ethnicity to a certain level and things like that. Um, so it doesn't have to actually be a country um, to be a nation. All right, and so nationalism is very strong, guys, because it creates a sense of identity. When you go in and... Um, you go to a new place and you're kind of like, ah, I don't know about this. Uh, and you are, so for example, uh, my wife and I, we're big K-State fans. If you see um, someone wearing a K-State hat uh, and you're a big K-State fan, you're going to go, okay, I can connect with this person somehow. Um, or a great example, guys, would be the Red Sox. If you're a Red Sox fan, they literally call themselves Red Sox Nation. Uh, and so there's almost this brotherhood there of, hey, we are both fans. I know that I can get along with you because uh, you share this with me, okay? Uh, and so there's this tremendous amount of identity that is created through nationalism. That's partially what makes it so powerful. Uh, and so these are three ideas that are going to be competing guys uh, throughout Europe. So after the Napoleonic Wars, guys, uh, Europeans, they're really going to start to push to unify the people of the same nationality. You, you know, they're going to have this big nationalist push that we talked about. Napoleon really kind of got going, guys, during the Napoleonic Wars. All right, so you have 1804 to 1813, guys. Uh, Serbians, they're going to fight for their independence against the Ottoman Empire. Um, so they said, hey, we are all Serbians. We want to have our own country together. Uh, they were defeated, guys, but it really united the Serbs. It really united the people, and they remembered that, and that was a big deal for them. Uh, 1821, you have a Greek revolt against the Ottomans. So remember, guys, the Ottoman Empire, it's this um, Muslim empire uh, in mostly present-day Turkey, but they also control a huge chunk of uh, southeastern Europe as well. Uh, and so <clears throat> the Greeks revolt, they actually get support of Western nations, a lot of that kind of stemming from, um, you know, the love of Greek culture, the ancient Greeks. And so they said, hey, we're going to throw in our support uh, for the Greeks like they did not for the Serbians. Uh, and so they will be successful because they will have some help from the outside world, um, from Western Europe. 
And so they will become independent in 1830. So now they have their own country, these Greek people do. Revolution of 1830. Uh, so this is really going to be more about uh, liberalism versus conservatism versus socialism, um, guys, rather than uh, maybe nationalism in this case. So 1824, Charles X, he inherits the throne of France. Um, he really tries to treat this as an absolute monarch of old guys so he suspends the legislator he limits the right to vote he's restricting the press he's saying hey you can't print those stories you can't print this story uh, and so liberals and radicals they start rioting the streets they're actually going to barricade the streets so they're going to uh, literally people are going to throw furniture out of their windows and things like that. They're going to um, throw um, tiles, roof tiles off um, and use those to throw it at soldiers. Um, <clears throat> and so they fire on French troops and they take control of Paris. They actually take control. Uh, and so the radicals, guys, as far as these liberals who took control, they want to establish a republic, uh, but the bulk of the liberals who are part of the bourgeoisie, the middle class, um, they, who are in, in the majority, they favor a constitutional monarchy. So we're getting rid of the old monarchy, we're gonna put in place a constitutional monarchy again, like we had during the early stages of the revolution. Uh, so they call for Louis Philippe Charles's uh, cousin to be king. Uh, and so Louis Philippe, he had supported uh, the liberals, the upper middle class, and so obviously they supported him. And so they put him in place as a constitutional monarch, and he ruled uh, understanding, hey, the legislature is going to have a big say, you know, we're going to be letting people vote again. Uh, and so that was a big change in France. 1830, Poland. You have the Poles also revolted. Uh, so Poland at that time was part of Russia. Uh, now, they weren't successful. The Russian troops quickly crushed this revolt. Um, but you have yet another group of people saying, hey, nationalism, we want our own country uh, revolting. Okay, and then 1831, guys, you have the Belgians, who are encouraged by the French, uh, they're going to fight and win their independence. Uh, and so there's another example of a successful revolution. So people in Europe are looking around going, hey, if they can do it, we can do it. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, another revolt, guys, breaks out in France. The people of, of France are not content once again. So this, is, this time is the revolt of 1848. Uh, and so there's a lot of discontent, discontentment in France at this time. Uh, the liberals, they feel like they've been betrayed by Louis Philippe. Um, they have not been uh, getting that suffrage, which means the right to vote. Uh, there's a lot of corruption in his, in his government, and so they're not happy. The socialist faction guys of, of the liberals, uh, they're saying, hey, one of the things that needs to happen is we need to end private ownership of, of property, okay? And so remember, guys, socialism is this idea of the redistribution of wealth, okay? I'm gonna, we're going to take this from this person, and we're, we're going to give it to these people. Uh, this is going even farther than that, guys. That is um, essentially communism if there's no private property uh, that is owned. Um, it's all run by the state. Okay, so during this time, guys, and this should sound familiar, this is kind of shades of the French Revolution. Um, you're in the middle of a recession, so the economy's down, crops are bad, uh, so there's a lack of food. And we said these are big factors that get people to say, hey, enough is enough. All right, so uh, February days, guys, rolls around, the world government. They're trying to silence their critics, uh, and this just outrages them even more. 
And so once again, the French people take to the streets. Once again, they barricade the streets against the French troops. Uh, they call for Louis Philippe to ad <coughs> abdicate the throne. Remember, guys, that means to, to step down uh, from the throne and let someone else rule. Uh, you have these radical socialists. They declare France a republic. And so remember, guys, uh, for a while there, for a short while, uh, France was a republic during the French Revolution. Uh, now you have a second republic, the second republic um, of France. And so once again, guys, the radicals, socialists, uh, they're di they've divided the new government. Uh, liberals want moderate change. Socialists, they want major change. Like we said, get, getting rid of private property. The socialists, they want... Uh, the government to set up these national workshops. So now that we've got industrialization happening, um, they want more jobs. They want the government to create more jobs uh, for people who are unemployed. Um, and for the first time, it appears like the socialists, they have the edge, like they are going to have the majority. Uh, but then in comes June days. And so by June, guys, the liberals, they're used to uh, kind of having power. They're used to politics uh, in French society, and so they're able to kind of politically outmaneuver uh, the socialists that had been controlling the government in France, and they're able to win the majority. Uh, and so now they're going to, to win out and, and kind of push for what they want. They're going to shut down the national workshops. They felt like it was a waste of money. Uh, but a prop that is, guys, workers, when they are no longer working at the workshops, now they're hitting the streets and they're rioting. They're upset again. But this time, you have liberals opposing them. You have peasants opposing them, which the peasants, guys, from the countryside, they're uh, worried about their lands being taken away by socialism. You know, hey, we haven't had these lands for very long. Um, you look at uh, the revolution and all that. So they're fearful of, hey, well, are we going to go back to where I don't own any land? I don't like that. I've worked and scraped uh, for this land, and now I might lose it. And so they rally together against uh, these socialists that are rioting in the street, and they put it down. Uh, and so you have a really short-lived republic, unfortunately, for France. Uh, where, once again, the liberals, they're going to take control of the National Assembly, um, and they're going to create a strong president. Um, so they, they don't keep, they don't reinstate a king, but they create a powerful head of state. And now they are going to give all men the right to vote, something that they at one time had uh, for a short while. They're going to reinstate that. <clears throat> and so when they vote for who they want to be um, this strong head of state, this president, they overwhelmingly vote for Louis Napoleon, Napoleon's nephew. Uh, so kind of this idea of, hey, we want to go back to being a strong, strong country, um, a strong empire. And so they overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly uh, elect him to be president. But, guys, by 1852, he, once again, like his uncle, is going to say, you know what, I'm not happy with this. I'm just going to name myself emperor. Uh, and so 1852, he proclaimed himself emperor. And so, once again, you have a short-lived uh, republic in France, right? So from Spain, from um 1848 to 1852. Uh, and so now you're you're back to one person essentially being in control uh, under Louis Napoleon. All right, guys, that does it for today. We'll pick up again later on in class with uh, revolts in Latin America as well. Uh, but for now, I hope you guys are uh, doing well, and I look forward to talking to you this week.